Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Foxtrot Forum this evening. So thanks very much indeed for, for joining us. Um, I thought we'd start off this evening, here we are with our summer Foxtrot Forum, uh, with, a little, uh, with a little video. So let me just put that on and we'll get going and a little reminder of some of the highlights so far this year. Carol Zarina plugs on at the one pace, so too does Millie Round. And now inside the final half furlong, Whispering Gypsy, she's made all of the running and she can coast home from here. She's five lengths clear, this opening race of the day, well won. For Bridget Andrews and Dan Skelton, Whispering Gypsy is home. The final half furlong they go, and Barley Body has always travelled well. He's going to take this out nice in the end by a soon after three lengths. It's length through. Ultimate getaway with the lead over the final flight. A better leap than sensational in second. Happy Larry at half a length away in third. Racing into the closing stages. It's ultimate getaway. Sent clear by Paddy Brennan. And Paddy's going to double up on the night here for Fergal O'Brien and win this quite decisively at the line. They've gone right away, gone eight lengths clear. They now run towards their final furlong here and ultimate fame takes over under Paddy Brennan. Salcombe running on well the outside. Bari Breeze is sticking in there on the inner. It's not quite over yet. They run to the last half furlong. Ultimate fame under an all-action Paddy Brennan. Salcombe is really getting a second wind and pressing hard. Ultimate fame though in front and ultimate fame prevails. Going to the last and safely over. Picked up much the best there. Here comes Johnny and is now stretching right away from Sublime Heights and Tallow for Cole and racing up towards the line. Here comes Johnny under a big penalty. Goes on to win. One more good jump should seal it. He's over it safely. Oh, ship of the fan didn't deserve that in second. He's up okay, but it's a bloodless win in the end for ultimate getaway. Mr. Muldoon from the Paddy Pie at the last. Think about this last jump. No issues there, Mr. Muldoon is on the flat. It's another Sedgefield success for Mr. Muldoon. Well up to Richard Newland. Carnet by Charlie Hammond. Mr. Muldoon is the easy winner. It's Ginger Deval from Pay the Woman. The leader made a mistake, and Pay the Woman is now alongside Yortham. He's held in third. Pay the Woman with 150 yards on the flat to go. Ginger Deval is trying to rally, but Pay the Woman under James Best has a length advantage running up towards the line, and Pay the Woman beats Ginger Deval by just less the than a length. Now inside the final foot and a half. One more flight to take, anything for love, and hateful on the near side just have the lead. Sandy Mount Rose is on the far side, Rainer's World is staying on and seating the rider Uptown Lady. Misty Whiskey looks held, they've still got a half furlong to go. Anything for love is all out, leads by about two lengths to Sandy Mount Rose in second. Misty Whiskey is back in third, but as they race up towards the line, it is anything for love who outstays them to take this Jane Seymour Mayor's Novices Hurdle. It was anything for love and Paige Fuller from Sandy Mount Rose, Misty Whiskey and Rainer's World. Okay, well, welcome back everyone and thanks very much indeed for joining me this evening. Um, it's great to be back with our Foxtrot Forum. I'm absolutely delighted to have so many people here joining us again. Let's have a look. We've got about 20 people joining us live on uh, YouTube and another 50 people joining us this evening here uh, on Zoom. So thanks very much indeed for, for joining us. So just a little bit of admin before we get going. Um, in the top right view and if you do that you can choose a speaker view or gallery view so you can select whether or not you wish to see lots of different people or just the person that, that's speaking at, at the time so um
Ah, Hi everyone, I'm back on my second computer. My first computer completely went, so it's just turned itself off. So anyway, I'm back, but I'm no longer on the beach, uh, which is a shame, but never mind. Anyway, I'm here in my office. Uh, that was a quick transfer. Anyway, good job I had my reserve uh, laptop going, just in case anything went wrong. Um, so let's get on with the forum, because you're not here to listen to me, and I'm absolutely delighted we've got some really great guests this evening. Uh, we've got joining us this evening Mark Gickero, who's a bloodstock agent, and we've also got Oliver Greenall, who's our new Foxtrot trainer, so delighted that he'll be joining us later. Um, and we've got Dr Richard Newland, who's going to be our first guest on. But just before we speak to him, I've got a couple of things I want to say. First of all, happy birthday to Helen Cameron, who I know is watching us and joining in. So happy birthday to you. And delighted that Mike Tudor's joined us from the USA as well. So Mike, a very well-known uh, owner and also Stoke City fan, um, but he's joining us from America. So great to have people from all over the world joining us this evening. So Richard, I think you're with us. Are you, are you, can you hear me okay? I, loud and clear, Dan. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah. Let me just turn you up so I can hear you a little bit better. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us this evening, Richard. And uh, uh, obviously, the yard has been in terrific form. You must be you must be absolutely thrilled with how the summer's gone. Yeah, really good, really good. You know, I think we're lying in fourth in the championship. Uh, we don't expect to stay there, obviously, because we haven't got the volumes of the, of the, of the really big yards, and don't wouldn't choose to have the volumes of the big yard, but. Um, it's always nice if this time of year if we can get a few on the board and um, and get off to a good start and we've done that so I'm, I'm pleased with the way things are going and it's it's been particularly relevant for us those that know the yard well or have been to visit will know that we've changed the training regime a fair bit this summer so we, we've got this new regime using this deep sand canter that uh, the gallop only you know was only finished in sort of April time so uh, it's been very satisfying that that is definitely seems to be meeting, you know, our expectations in terms of the levels of fitness we're getting from the horses and the results. Mm, absolutely. And it was on one of our forums that we actually announced about the new Red Caps concept. And um, so, yeah. I mean, that's been absolutely fantastic. And you must be absolutely delighted with how that's gone. Uh, absolutely. And I, I hope everyone else, uh, you know, all Red Caps that are on the, on the um, Red Cap supporters that are on the, on the, on the <coughs> call tonight are too. I think from my point of view, it's enormously, it's good fun. Um, I, I particularly enjoy the challenge of the selection of the horses, you know, budget horses. I mean, remember, you know, the whole purpose was to try to get a little team together without spending too much money that where we could put the team together and get some, uh, and hopefully have some success. And I think we've had, um, well, I know we've oh, had four wins. Is it four or five? Four wins. Four wins, four wins, yeah. but it's four wins, but so far, but we've had, what's particularly satisfying is that every horse has been competitive at some stage. Uh, it's, a, it's either, you know, so every horse has, has, has either been first or second. And you know, given that when, you, when you're buying these horses from the sales or other people are choosing to get rid of them and you're not, you're picking them up for uh, lower sums of money, they, that, that's, in my eyes, that's quite a good achievement that we've found horses that can compete. And, um, and, and, and by the way, I very much hope there's plenty more to come because I, I've specifically allowed one or two, um, just a bit of time to recharge the batteries so we can go again nice and fresh after this little summer break. We've got the people may not be aware, but jump racing, there is no jump racing from, um, uh, from now for, uh, for two weeks to encourage jockeys and, and stable staff and so on, but jockeys in particular to go and have holidays. Uh, yep. Sorry, Richard. Uh, we, somehow we've ended up with you muted. It may be my error. So you just need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Got it. Done. Perfect. Done. Well done. Did you miss much? Did you miss much or not? No, not at all. Just the last it couple of seconds. It probably wasn't worth listening to anyway, but um, I'm happy to repeat it. Now, I'm just saying that I've left a bit of juice in these horses deliberately. So we've got we've got plenty to look forward to. I don't want to sort of um, run them into the ground before we've got this little two week summer break now, um, which is largely designed to encourage people like the jockeys to take a holiday because otherwise they'd be literally riding every week of the year. So um, 
So there's a two week holiday. So we should have some nice, fresh red caps to go again straight after the break from about the 14th of August. So and, and I'm you know, beginning to get things mapped out for them. Well, while we talk about the red caps, I put together a little video just of some of our highlights. And as you say, the fact that all five horses have finished either first or second is absolutely incredible. So let's just take a quick reminder of what's happened so far this summer with the red caps. Dani is now being ridden and travelling better, it seems, is Tiger Orchid, who's come there very strongly under Sam Twist and Davis, the white face of Battle March getting into contention, further back to Moscow Spy and then Boss Over Bill, who's dropping back, and then comes a Holiday Ridge and Sally's Girl, and bluff me if you can, but having travelled well, Tiger Orchid has now been sent on and they're approaching the final furlong and a half, he's drawn three lengths clear from Battle March in second, front running Dani's no more to give, he's going to be joined for third by bluff me if you can, who's a little errant, but he's making great progress but into the closing stages Tiger Orchid is smoothly drawing clear to make a winning debut under rules and only has to be shaken up by Sam Twist and Davis to win by the best part of 10 lengths back in second place was Battle March keeping on well bluff me if you can has finished third it's a case of deja vu here with Sam Twist and Davis sitting pretty it seems aboard the Fox Trot Racing representative for Dr. Richard Newland. Blue Ribbon is two lengths clear as they come towards the final flight. So it comes to take it now over safely. Extends the lead to four lengths. Sayar's being pressed for second by Raven Court, who's run on Valentino Dancer and Bashful Boy. But into the closing stages, Blue Ridge ribbon is pulling right away in the closing stages and will indeed score for the first time of asking for Dr Richard Newland who doubles up in company with the Foxtrot racing the red caps heading towards the final two then heading towards it golden card pardon me giving chase Guy of Vallis in behind with Blackjack Tennessee another mistake and Guy of Vallis has gone heading to the final fence golden card but pardon me is putting in a big challenge now rebel lead is also running on from the back then comes Blackjack Tennessee the final fence then three him of a chance pardon me touchdown in front rebel leader tries to run on golden card can find no more it's pardon me out in front for harry bannister pulling out all the stops and pardon me has won from rebel leader who stayed in second to... position lord schnapps who's still going well then candy berg in third followed then in fourth by delight of dubai is staying on second last it's wagner that leads wagner out in front to lord schnapps in second these two have now just kicked on a little bit to delight of dubai then 16 letters of fall accord duty when beaten at the back of the field down towards the final fence they come wagner prominent throughout. Lord Schnapps has travelled well throughout. They jumped the, the last almost as one. Wagner the near side. Lord Schnapps, delight of Dubai, is still staying on towards the near side as well. Inside the final furlong they go and it's Wagner who's pulling out all the stops here. Wagner by a length, length and a half to Lord Schnapps who's battling hard but racing up towards the line. Wagner has taken this out nicely. Two in second, possibly Lord Schnapps, yes, over delight of Dubai. And then in fourth, the fast finishing out for justice. And Phoenix Dawn is the one that is gradually staying on in the red cap. Has moved through now to press second, then Eclair de Sablon, Invincible Wish, comes down towards the second last, not quite so clever over that, and Phoenix Dawn is beginning to edge closer on the run down towards the last, Invincible Wish, out in front, Phoenix Dawn closes now to within just over a length and a half, Invincible Wish needs one more flying leap, Invincible Wish gets into the bottom of it, no better, it's Phoenix Dawn, short run in, Invincible Wish, Phoenix Dawn closing on the run to the line, Invincible Wish, Phoenix Dawn close! Very close between the two. So Tiger Orchid from First Street with Maxell moving into third at the top of the home straight. In memory of Millie is fourth but ridden and losing ground and goes wide on the home turn to drop to the rear of the field as they head down the straight. They've got just over three furlongs to go. Tiger Orchid is the leader as the pace begins to lift. First Street is pushed along in second. Maxell is third. They're being pursued by Parsons Stone and then a little gap back to Tampico Rocco. Time to Believe is struggling to lay a glove on the leaders. Twiggy's Pride's being left behind. They've got a quarter of a mile to gallop and it's still Tiger Orchid on the outside of First Street who's hard ridden and a length down. Maxell is keeping on at the one pace. They've drawn away from Parsons and Stone heading inside the final 200 yards. Tiger Orchid still about a length up on First Street running into the final 50 yards. Tiger Orchid makes all to defy a penalty in the bumper under Sam Twist and Davies.
Great. Well, thank you. It was really good to see some of those highlights from the Red Caps. And I hope you enjoyed watching those. Um, just, uh, Richard, you mentioned there about your, your sand gallop. Yeah. Just, just tell us a little bit more about that. So, so you've now been using it for a few months and, and the results seem to be pretty good by the sound of it. And you must be happy. And how have you found sort of learning about the sand gallop and how it works? Presumably a bit of sort of experimentation and finding that, that what works and what doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, 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 we trialed a few horses uh, at Ben Brain's gallop. So Ben Brain, the, the wind surgeon, has a very nice sand canter, which he uses for his um, exercise um, um, overground scopes. Was a, when, when, they, when a horse got a wind problem, we gallop, they gallop them on the, on the deep sand there and, it, and then he, and he monitors the winds. Because we know Ben quite well, we, we, we did a few trials there before we started and um, measuring different speeds and seeing what it was doing to horses' heart rates. Because um, as people know, we do a lot of heart rate monitoring of horses and fitness, and we've been doing a tremendous amount of measurement. This is all led by Rod, um, Rod Trow, my assistant trainer. And um, but you're right; it, it's at this stage, it's pretty sort of um, speculative in terms of what, what what constitutes the right training program. What we're doing, our sort of, uh, if you like, bog standard, is that we have six weeks of what we call pre-training. Uh, which would start off that you, you've got the horses have got to be a certain level of fitness really to be able to cope with the sand because it is hard work for them. It really is deep sand. It's, you know, and they, you know, they, um, but the big thing from my point of view is it, it, it's allowing us to get horses probably as fit as we ever have done, but at doing it at slower speeds. And, and the significance of slower speed really is with injuries. Because the bane of all of our lives as a, who train people who train national hunt racehorses is trying to keep them in one piece and not being injured. Because we're asking an awful lot of them. We're making galloping them every day. Um, we're putting them under a lot of pressure. And if you think on a typical, um, before I used the sand canter, we were doing three miles six days a week for every horse, eighteen miles a week, sixteen weeks in a row. And a lot of horses just can't cope with it. Um, now, so we've had. Um, I can think top of my head. I can think of two or three horses that have come back from injury this year and done extremely well. And by the way, the one, the one I hope, the next one I hope will be Mr. Chiang, um, you know, who, who is very close to running. And now, you know, horses that have had tendon strains or suspensory ligament injuries before, it, it, you're always, you're trying to get them really fit, but at the same time, you don't want them to break down at home. And all the, I mean, we had a, a great big horse, some people might have seen me run called Maka Packer ran the other day. He, he's, he really, he's had a, 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 he's got a very bad suspensory ligament injury. It, it's, it's been, in, he's been injured in both parts of that ligament. And he's a huge horse as well, which doesn't help. He's near, he, you know, well over 17 hands. And, um, but we, he's, he's managed to cope with it and got back to the track and has come through his race. So, and um, so I'm very, very pleased. We're getting, I would say equally good results as we did with, up, up the Linnickers Hill. I wouldn't say it's better, but I'd say equal. And But it, we, we definitely, the early signs are very positive in terms of less injuries. Hmm. Yeah. Well, as you say, we know how frustrating those injuries are. So that's, uh, that's got, got, got to be very good news. Hmm. I know one of, the, uh, one of the horses that's been using the sand gallops and has been an absolute star for Foxtrot this summer has been, I'm so busy. Um, just missed out on a on a hat trick, and he's been absolutely uh, you know real real sort of stalwart for the yard, but also for for us, and very very exciting to follow. Um, I've actually got a little video just for those that aren't involved in I'm so busy, and let's just uh, let's put that on, and then just a very quick reminder of what he's achieved so far this summer. So that many of you will have read the the weekly update where he went. Uh, last week for his hat trick of wins and only just missed out so he's been a, a fantastic horse for us and let's just have a little review of his season so far
Well, I'm so busy and Sam Twist and Davis well on their way to the second last. They've cleared that one safely and Sam has a long look in behind. He'll see that Helford River, the yellow sleeves, is still second. Storm Arcadio third and snow stopping him back in fourth. They're coming home at wide margins in behind. I'm so busy is at the last and is over clear and he's now going to saunter up the running with about 200 yards to cover. I'm so busy, and Sam Twiston Davis really has been anything but in the saddle. He merely has to shake up the favourite briefly to make sure, but I'm so busy will saunter home, making all for an emphatic success. Helford River is just second, Storm Arcadio third. I'm so busy, but Catbird's seat is closing. Only a length down, heading towards the final two. Omerl comes next with Matawan trying to stay on. Then comes Art Mann. Over two out. Catbird's seat not as fluent as I'm so busy. Matawan's chasing them down in third place. Then in behind Omerl and Art Mann. Heading to the final flight. Getting very vigorous sound twist in Davis. And on I'm so busy. Catbird's seat not going away. But again, all oh, very untidy. And has gone at the last. Slightly interfering with Matawan. So I'm so busy has been left clear. Five or six lengths in front, chased by Matawan. Art Mann is running on into third. Might challenge for second yet, heading up towards line. Despite being pretty tired, I'm so busy, we'll make it back-to-back -back wins at Utoxeter. Art Mann stays on for second. Then in third was Matawan. A question or two, Vancouver becoming outpaced, running down towards two out. Drumsara, who pulled up a hurdle earlier. Coral and Passio continue to dominate. On their way down to the final flight with Mix of Clover, I'm so busy, and the Volen all giving chase, but Coral is found more, jumps the last a length in front of Passio, I'm so busy the Volen on the near side, mix of Clover on the hills of the leading quartet, Coral, I'm so busy and the Volen on the near side of the three going clear, Coral can't go on, the Volen on the near side gets up near the finish, the Volen from I'm so busy, back in third, the long time leader Coral, Passio, Dock of the Bay Well, we've had a lot of fun with I'm So Busy this summer and uh, hopefully a bit, bit more fun to come with him. But you must be delighted with how he's run. I really am, Dan. I mean, I think um, it, actually he and another horse um, both disappointed me at first, the first runs in the winter. And I, I, I'm benefit of hindsight. We did absolutely the right thing, which was just rather than just carry on, we gave them a break, mini break, refreshed the batteries and started again. And we've been rewarded. And the other one I was thinking of is Wigglesworth, who actually won um, just the other day. So, um, you know, um, the owners have been, of I'm so busy, been very patient because initially it was a bit disappointing. But now he looks very promising indeed. Certainly he'll make a chaser. I thought he was very unlucky in that race. It pained me actually watching that video again um, at Worcester because I thought he was really unlucky not to win because, first of all, I think it was a, a well above average um race for this time of year in, in, in that of that grade and um we know that the um fergal source was very heavily fancied etc and it um but when you get mugged like that you know the, the horse was being genuine he never saw the volan until the volan has put, put his nose in front right on the line we had no chance to battle back i've got a little my eyes actually there's a race at there's a race at newton abbott which sadly is not as um good prize money as it used to be but it's still a, a, a slightly better race. And that's uh, Saturday, the 21st of August. Two mile, five and a half. So for Newton Abbott, quite a flat track. So I, I think we might have a go at that. That was, that was in my head anyway. Great. But, but he's been, I mean, he'll definitely be one that um, when the handicapper catches up with him, I would expect him to be going over fences next year and, 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 and being, a, being a, a good candidate for that. Great. Well, certainly a, a horse to look forward to, but one that's already given us a lot of fun. Um, now, we've had a, a, a question, Richard, about the red caps, if I can go back to red caps. So uh, we've really enjoyed the red caps this year, but are you going to do it again next summer? So what, what do you think? Well, it depends how much interest there is. I think uh, I'm relying on the group and to, to, to hear from people or through you, Dan, as to you know whether there's a, a interest to do it again. I'd love to do it again. I absolutely love it. And I think it it's also, it sort of makes sense to me because we're buying horses here um, that uh, at a price that is justifies the kind of races and the prize money they're at, the grade of racing in the summer. We're choosing a team with different types of horses. You know, we've got a one horse been running in bumpers and is going to go for a maiden hurdle. Another one's, you know, two mile handicap hurdles. Lord Schnapps is a big chasing type. 
a blue ribbon. I'm not quite sure what he is, but um, he was. I have to say, well, I've seen that video earlier on of him winning at Worcester. I can see why Sam Twister was so excited. He was pulverizing them. So we've got to get him back on track. But I'd love to do it. It, it takes a bit of time because. My job, obviously, is to hunt out five new horses. Uh, where we, and it, so it would be nice if we we're going to do it again that we sort of make a decision by late summer. So because really from October I need to be shopping, or and, and looking to pick horses up. So, um, but uh, but it, it depend on everyone else really is where they like to do it. But I'm absolutely game for it. Well, I know you put in a, a huge amount of work sourcing these horses, and it's not a not an easy task at all. But you must be absolutely thrilled with the way that the, the horses have run and, and shown, I think, your ability to pick up these horses for very little money and uh, and have a huge amount of fun with them. So I think the feedback has been fantastic. And if we could do it again next year, um, I think let's let, let's go because we've had such a great summer. And hopefully, as you said earlier, more more fun to come. Great. No, I'd like that. So we've talked a lot about the summer, Richard, but we've got a, quite a few exciting horses for the winter. Now, a few familiar names. And one of the things I love about National Hunt Racing, of course, is that you see those names season after season. And, uh, and we love seeing them come out. But we've also got a few new horses um, mm. that perhaps aren't that familiar to us. And I thought maybe I could just ask you to tell us a little bit of background about the new horses that we've got in the yard for the, for the coming sort of winter season, if you like. Now, before you mentioned about Mr. Chiang, who, although he's been yeah. in the yard a little while, um, hasn't yet run. But is there anything else to sort of add in, add in for, for him? Uh, Mr. Chiang is in great form. Um, he's ready to go now. Uh, he's done loads and loads of schooling. I would say he wasn't the, the very quickest learner but he's definitely got the hang of it now and he's had lots of practice. So, um, and he's, and he's quietly sort of pleased us more and more as he's got fitter, which is often the way. Um, and so, no, I'm really looking forward to him. He's one that um, I need to start looking for races and it, it will not be very far away. Um, so two, 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 three weeks time, he could be on a track uh, running in a two mile maiden hurdle under thought. And um, we've got to watch a little bit, you know, he's coming back from a tendon injury um, people tell me there's another heat wave coming. Um, we have to watch uh, if it gets very. I wouldn't want him to run on super firm ground. Um, I mean, he probably wants good ground to perform well, but nice watered ground at Worcester or your or whatever would be fine. But he's he he's definitely on track and he's trained well. Perfect. So can I mention the other horse we've got? I don't it's, know if you want me to uh, remind you. We've got a uh, we've got King Arise. Yeah, uh, King Arise. King Arise, lovely, a lovely grey horse uh, by Kingston Hill. Uh, obviously, just starting off now. He he's one that like uh, it's talk about this sourcing of horses. And firstly, your next, your later guest, of course, I do a lot of work with. He's a great help, Mark Jicaro. Um, he's very, very good at it. Um, but um, King Arise has come from a different route. He's come from my um, a, a good friend of mine locally. It's Tom Weston, the Weston family. I know them very well. He used to be my amateur jockey. Tom, Tom's become a very astute point-to-point -point trainer now. And there's some nice horses coming through the English point-to-point -point circuits rather than the Irish ones. And um, they're a bit more um, realistic value. Tiger Orchid came through the English point-to-point. -point. He actually started in Ireland, had one run, then was sold to England, and then we got him. But I think... Um, uh, King Arise looks a lovely horse, but he and he and he won his um, point to point bumper. Um, but but he's did lots of schooling with us before we let him down. He's back in training now, but he's only very early days started. I see it's a, it's a sort of um, a very nice horse to go forward with. You need a bit of luck. It's we don't know who which of the ones that are going to be able to put season after season together. But he, he's certainly a lovely horse, and everyone really likes him. You should make a chaser. You'd expect him to yeah. be a chaser. Well, I did see a, a, a very astute point-to-point -point, uh, chap who, who produces his 10 horses to follow each year from the British point-to-point -point field. And I saw King Arise was was mentioned in that as a horse to follow this year. So Blimey. He's, a, he's a very astute guy. He came up with Ultimate Getaway a couple of years ago, and that proved to be a pretty good, good guess. So... Um, Good. Really looking forward to seeing King Arise. And then we've got two others uh, who are sort of new into the yard for the winter. So yeah. we've got 45 West, and I'm never quite sure how to pronounce it. Bolland Lee, is it? It's, it who's been bought by the Cade Land Syndicate. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I don't know how to pronounce it either. Um, uh, and both curiously uh, by, by the same style of foo, and um, both curiously have come from the. Um, I am right. He said from the same uh, trainer um, whose name I also can't pronounce. The lady uh, trainer who hasn't trained many winners, if any, in Ireland, but none. Um, and um, both interesting prospects. Both six-year-olds. Bernard Lee's obviously a mare. She put up a, a very interesting performance um, in, um, in, in you know uh, in her points points and um, forty-five West as well. He's run twice, been placed twice. Shown above average promise in decent point to points in Ireland. Now, one of the things is one of the, the thing, one of the things that one can be a bit nervous about is when one buys a six-year-old and they've not raced until they're six. But this year, of course, everyone's got the perfect excuse, which is that there was no with COVID, there was no point to pointing in Ireland last year. So if you wanted to start them off at five, which is what would be probably normal, four or five. Um, you couldn't. So they started at six, and and that I've certainly been told on a number of occasions that that's um, what's happened. But no, they're both good recruits, but they're sensibly priced. They're realistically priced, and you know I I think that's very relevant. There's no point. You know we can all be we can all buy superstars if we're prepared to pay ten million pounds for them. But you know to, if you're running for novice hurdles where it's three thousand pounds to the winner, you can't justify it. So I, I'm not a believer in overpaying for these horses, as you know. And uh, but nevertheless, these are all horses with their better, their best days ahead of them. And, you know, assuming they stay sound and they all sound and fine. At the, moment. the last two, 45 West and Bonnetly, are actually I'm still leaving them in the field. But we, it's, it, we're pretty close to starting. We've been starting those batches. We're selling a few horses at the sales this week. And I would say by this time next week, we'll be starting them off. Great. Well, we're really excited, you know, really excited to have some new new horses, some new names in the field, uh, sorry, in the, in the yard. And and obviously, you know, some lots of familiar horses as well coming back in at the moment. So you, you must be really looking forward to, to the winter season. I am, actually. I really am, Dan. And I'm also, um, we, for a little update on the yard, we, we've started building another 20 boxes at um, the new yard. That's not really to get bigger, but that's really with, now we're very happy with the sand canter, looking to move. We're working out of two sites at the moment and it would be logistically be better to start moving to one site. So that's the plan. Um, and actually not just the names that you've mentioned and Foxtrot have taken on, but thank you very much for those. But we've actually got another half dozen, I would say, We've built about probably 10 or 12 new recruits have come in, all in the similar, but all plenty to prove, but all new names for us too. So, um, you know, it's, all, as you say, it's exciting. We need some new fresh blood. And uh, we know that the these wretched people that call themselves handicappers make your life a misery. You, you get punished. The, the better you do, the more you get punished. So um, it, it, it's, um, it's we, it, we need some new blood, and it, but it's exciting to have it. And, and now is that lovely time of year when they're all just starting off and they're all, they're all coming in slowly from the field, as I say, our last batch to come in, and then we'll be fully stocked with all the winter horses. Brilliant. Well, we can't wait. Really looking forward to it. But hopefully plenty of fun to come with our summer horses sort of in the second yes. half of the season after this break, first of all. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Well, Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the couple of weeks without any racing. Hopefully you're able to relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you in the second half of the summer season and, and really look forward to the winter. So, Richard, thanks again for taking the time to join us. Cheers, Dan. Thank you very much. Bye. Great. Well, really good of Richard Newham to join us this evening. And thanks for his insight into our, particularly, I think, our Red Caps horses, but also uh, I'm So Busy and some of the new horses we've got in the yard for the coming winter season. Um, now, I'm delighted to say that this year we've got a, a new Foxtrot mm -hmm. trainer and Oliver Greenall is, uh, is joined the Foxtrot rank. And I'm hoping that he's with us. Oliver, are you, are you on online, as it were? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Great. Well, thanks again for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Um, and as I mentioned, um, new trainer to Foxtrot. So um, uh, don't worry, we don't do these forums very often, but we're really thrilled to have you on board. And, uh, you know, it, you must feel like your career's reached a peak now that you've become a Foxtrot trainer. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a great accolade to have. 
I've uh, been watching your horses winning plenty. And uh, yeah, it's always been something I wanted to. Uh, I think when you get a new owner of any sort that's, you know, approaches you, it's a nice, it's, a, it's something, you know, it's nice. It means you're doing something right. So hopefully that's, uh, it can uh, keep going like that. Well, I think that's right. And as you know, we, you know, we're, we're looking for trainers who we think are young, are hungry, are, are getting better. And, you know, I think that your results, particularly over the last couple of years, have really been outstanding. And uh, and so we want to be part of that. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have you on board as, as one of our trainers. Um, but just tell us a little bit about those of you that are sort of members that, that aren't so familiar with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your sort of pathway into becoming a trainer? Yeah, so, um, so I was brought up in uh, Darsbury, which is near Warrington. Uh, my parents are both both uh, ride horses. Dad was a, an ex-jockey and then was chairman of Aintree for 25 years. My mum is a Weatherby, so is his daughter of the, the Weatherby family. So sort of, the, you know, is all in that side. So so I didn't have a lot of choice growing up, really. We always had ponies. Um, Dad obviously always took us racing and stuff. So got to about 17 and Dad bought me a pointer pointer very kind of him and um yeah it, it, it just had a great great time doing that really and I left school and went to work for Mick Easterby in North Yorkshire for eight years um rode a lot of his horses um and was very lucky to ride a lot of nice horses uh ride, rode a Chel Cheltenham winner Cheltenham Festival winner and stuff like that so yeah it was it was brilliant and um point to pointing out on the track and then I sort of did that for 10 years the weight wasn't great I was sort of getting to a stage where I either wanted to go professional or or probably you know stop really um just that the miles on the road really were doing me and i was doing sort of sixty thousand miles as an amateur um and not getting paid so you know it was it was great fun but i couldn't do it forever i got a job offered to go and work for tom george as his conditional uh, which i was excited about but then at that point sam thomas lost his job at nichols's and then took the job at sam thomas's so um at tom george's so that sort of didn't look like it was going to be very fruitful. So I decided instead of sort of being a sort of mid to lower tier conditional, I would, um, I would look to start point to point training. So I, I moved to where I am now, which is in Molpus near, um, near Chester, about 20 minutes south of Chester, um, where Steve Wynn was training and he just gave up. Um, so it just seemed the right sort of time. So I farmed and, um, and trained point to pointers from here for five years. And we did well point to pointers. We never, we never, you know, hit the heights, really. We, we didn't have that many. We probably just, we, you know, still point of point, you probably just need to spend a bit more than what we were spending. But it was a great sort of grounding. We learned, I learned how to use the gallops. Um, it was just a great education, really. Um, and then Josh Guerriero was um, at Dan Skelton's and he was sort of a bit of a crossroads. He'd done three years there, setting them up. Um, and I think he felt he just wanted to do something a bit more on his own. And I've been friends with Josh for a long time. So we decided to go into partnership. Um, I'd take the license, but we trained together. Um, and that's what we did, really. And it just it went from strength to strength. Um, and he is actually going to get his trainers like, you know, we, we're going to have a dual license come next season. So, um, you know, I think he just brought a lot of ideas up from Dan Skelton's. I'd been here long enough to sort of know the, know the place and the area and got a good base of owners. Um, so it sort of it worked well really i think we had 10 winners our first year then 15 20 25 and then we had 37 last season so it's been it's, it's been nice and we've got you know we've we've slowly increased our facilities and um yeah we've got a good good group of owners and horses now and you mentioned the facilities there obviously we had a fantastic visit around the yard and you looked after us extremely well um, but just tell us a little bit about the, for those that weren't able to come to that visit, tell us a little bit about the facilities that you've got at the yard. Yeah, so we're very lucky. I mean, Cheshire isn't renowned for being the, you know, have a lot of big hills, but we're, we're lucky we've got, we've got a half a mile gallop, which is, is um, the first two furlongs is a very steep incline, and then it slowly gradually climbs the last sort of two and a half furlongs. So that's a carpet gallop that we do the majority of our work on. Um and then we've got a deep sand three furlong round gallop, which sort of a lot of trainers now have, um, which we had from the start, actually. So we use that for conditioning work. And then we've also got a mile straight flat gallop, which we tend to use just for the flat horses, really, that we, we don't actually tend to have anymore. But we, that was mainly, we've actually put all the schooling fence on that. So we can school sort of 365 days a year 
uh, you know, rain or shine on there. Otherwise, we, we, we can school on, on the grass as well. And we've got a jumping lane. We, we, we've done in the past very well with horse off the flat. Um, I think because we've got a loose school where we jump them loose to start with. And then we've got this jumping lane, which is an enclosed three furlong gallop. Um, with lots of sort of different jumps on logs and tyres and different things and that really gets them jumping but we use that with all the horses and they seem to really enjoy it um, so that's it really but we're, we're very lucky we're, we're sort of in the middle of nowhere we're a couple of miles from Malpas so it's very quiet horses tend to seem very relaxed we do well with horses especially from Newmarket and Lambourne that have suffered from ulcers or just seem very stressed we seem to do very well we've got a lot of turnout um, so we're very lucky in that sense um but yeah we've on our, on the website all the facilities there if you want to have a bit more of a look and there's some videos and stuff so um but that's generally it yeah well it was certainly very impressive when we came to look around the yard and as you mentioned at the end then the turnout is absolutely fantastic and i think what what we really felt was that it was a place of very happy horses you know the horse was so relaxed and uh, and obviously very happy and and i think you know we and, and you believe happy horses uh run better and so it was great to come along and really see that. And, and something you didn't mention that I picked up, you had a little stream sort of at the bottom of the gallops where the horses could go for a little splash and, you know, looked at really fantastic facilities you've got there. Yeah, no, no, we're very lucky. We've got a bit of everything. And um, yeah, like you say, we, we, you know, we are, I, you know, I, I see these horses every day, so it's hard to know. But a lot of people who come do, do always say they seem very relaxed and happy, which is, you know, especially with jump horses. I think, you know, flat horses, um, you know, you're, you're not training them for as long. It's just a different process. Jump horses, obviously, we're trying to train them to their sort of, you know, 12, 13. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a lot. It's a di- You know, you've got to keep them happy. If you don't, you know, they, they, they just won't last. Yeah. And I've been just talking about, obviously, we've, you know, been very, very impressed with your results that you've got. And where do you hope to go? What, what's the future ambition then for, for you as a trainer? So we, we, we've got 80 stables at the moment, which is which is where I want to be, really. Um, but at the moment, we probably still would only have 50 to 60 for the winter. Um, and the rest would be horses that are, you know, off injured or maybe just youngsters coming in. So I think the aim is to have the 80 boxes full of horses in training. Um, 80 horses isn't going to get you champion trainer, but I don't think that's our aim, really. It's just to have a successful business and train nice horses um, for, for decent owners. Um, that's all we want really I mean we're slowly getting our class of horse up now and I think last year was the first year we we had a couple of really decent horses and then this year we've probably just gone up a gear again um and you know, every trainer says they want to train good horses and it you know it's obviously you know that's what you want to do but I think you know training majority of nice horses training some good Saturday horses um is our aim really we're not we're not interested in probably the sort of numbers um of of, of some trainers you know I wouldn't want to get up any more than 80 really I think we're, I think we're pretty happy well one thing I have to say is in dealing with you and we've had a few phone calls and a visit and lots of emails and things in in the build-up to our new horse Kabinsky is I think your communication is absolutely outstanding you know we've had the syndicate have already had lots of videos footage from the gallops footage out of the field um, and just even dealing with me, I found you an absolute pleasure to deal with. Uh, I think every time I've rung you, you've, you've immediately answered the phone. You've been fantastic. And I think to me, that is so important in, in trainers. And I think it says an awful lot about you and that you are so keen to ensure that owners are, are well looked after. And uh, I think the experience we've had so far has been absolutely tremendous. So I just uh, take the opportunity to say a big, big thank you for making certainly making my life uh, very, very easy. Really is appreciated. Well, yeah, that's um, that's good to hear. But that that is that is that was always the key from the outset, and that is the advantage of Josh and me in the partnership because that is my sole role. I mean, I, I didn't really touch on this, but Josh trains the horses, he does the entries, he does the decks, he is on the yard. Whereas my sole role is dealing with the owners. I'm communicating between. I mean, obviously, me and Josh discuss every morning what the horses are doing, but he has the final say. Because when we started, we were both sort of deciding and it doesn't work like that. You know, we just we, did, we found out at the end he, he needs to make a decision on that. You know, I do the buying, the selling the horses and dealing with the owners. Um, so, you know, we just because we, we have so many syndicates um, and everybody wants to feel involved. You know, everybody should feel involved. Doesn't matter if you're paying £100 or, you know, £1,000 a month or whatever. You, you need to be involved. So, um, yeah, hopefully you, you do find that. And um, 
hopefully that's yeah, you know, it's all working well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been terrific so far. So uh, we've mentioned there Kabinsky, and let, let's talk a little bit about him. In fact, perhaps if it's okay, I might use one of those videos that you sent me, and uh, maybe I can play that. But if we can get the technology right, do you think you could talk over the top of the video and tell us a little bit about him? Should we? Should we give yeah, that a yeah. go? Yeah, no problem. Let's see if we can do that. So if I share this, and uh, if you talk, can we can we hear you? This, so this is Kaminska here. Yeah. So this is this is on the yard. As so as you can see, um, it's a lovely big bay gelding. He's, he's very striking, actually. You know, he's got those lovely big ears, very kind eye. Um, he's a sort of horse that when he's in the string, you, you know, you really look at him and think, oh, what's that? You know, I actually went out in the field the other day and I, I sort of forgotten which one he was. I looked, I thought, what's that horse? And, you know, that's Skabinski. He just, he is very striking. Um, Natty's quite small, the lady leading him around, but he, he is a big horse. He, he'd, he'd be 16 too. You know, he's a nice, he's going to be a chaser in the making in a couple of seasons time. Um, we, we, we had him in for just over a week. He was very, very straightforward. You know, like you can see here, he's very laid back. And that's what he's like every day. He, he you know, quite a lot, a lot, lot of the time, horses that come, they can be quite agitated when they first arrive to a new environment. But he was, he was very easy and uh, settled. This is him in, yeah, that's him there in second, sorry. So he takes a nice hold, you know, he's not lazy, which is perfect, but he's not keen either. Um, this is him winning at Newton Abbott. So obviously the form wasn't great. There were a lot of non-runners in the day, but I've had a lot of, I've had a good chat with Chris Honor about him. Um, and he really liked him actually um, he would have liked to have kept him in the yard if he could have done um, and they actually w fancied him before the non-runners um, so you know I think they had you know they, they backed him before before the non-runners came out so it was nice to see he, he obviously showed a bit of character he dropped the jockey on the way but it was just greenness really and that's almost what I liked he didn't look like a total professional I think if he'd come from a big yard and he'd done it very professionally I'd, I'd be almost more worried but you could tell even watching him go, you know, going to start and in the race, he was looking everywhere. He didn't really know his job. So he did it with, without any fuss, with, you know, and, and, he, and he seems to, he was in command the whole way, really. And I think there's plenty of improvement. So he's been really good. We've jumped him, we've schooled him. I mean, we've, we've, we've cantered him. And yeah, we're, he's at now having a bit of a summer break, but he won't lose all his fitness. So we'll get him back in probably two to three weeks. Um, you know, before he gets too fat and then he'll be running into the late autumn. Um, you know, being a young horse, he's been on the go for a fair while to get him ready for that bumper. So it, it's worked perfectly, really, that he has sort of six weeks off now. Um, and then we can crack on all winter with him. He obviously ran on sort of, I think it was, was it good, good to soft or something? It wasn't, it wasn't quick ground, but, you know, if you, if you looked at him, you definitely wouldn't say he wanted quick ground. I'd say he looks the perfect winter candidate. So, um, yeah, just can't wait to get him back in, really, and get cracking with him. Well, we're certainly looking forward to Kabinski, and uh, and putting my marketing hat on, I ought to mention, we've, we've not really done too much publicity over the shares, but there are two shares left available in Kabinski, so if anyone's interested in getting involved with him for the coming winter season, do drop me an email or give me a call after this, because I know that he's a, he's a lovely horse, and I know those shares are going to get snapped up very quickly. And uh, So do let me know if you'd like to get involved with Oliver and Kabinski for the coming season. Uh, now, just changing tack a little bit, um, I hear that you're a keen cyclist, and in fact doing a, a, a charity ride for racing welfare. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, hopefully you're all going to sponsor. Um, I'm not, I am a semi-keen cyclist. I'm not a sort of pro cyclist, but uh, Racing Welfare, who supports everybody who works in racing, whether on the race course, at stud, um, or, or in racing yards, um, are doing this. It's supposed to be 50 riders going from Carlisle to Newton Abbott over five days, so 100 miles a day for five days. I think they've got about 40 people doing it. There's a lot. There's a Tom Messenger from Dan's is doing it. Uh, ben Pauling's doing it. There's quite a few. I can't think on top of my head, but quite a lot of names you'll know. Hopefully, they're going to do a bit of um, media coverage on it. So, trying to raise plenty of money uh, for racing welfare. I, I sort of cycle, sort of in the summer a little bit, but I've been training quite a lot the last two months. I just um, hoping not to be at the back the whole time, basically. Um, but we're on this Strava group, and everybody seems very quick in the rest of the group. So I don't know, um, but. Um, 
yeah, we'll see. So yeah, if anybody wants to give some money, it'd be very, very um, kind of you. Um, just go on Just Giving and type in Oliver Green and it comes up. But um, yeah, all the support would be very, very, very great. Well, that sounds an amazing task. So, so wh when is that? When's the ride? Uh, we leave on August the 17th and we arrive at Newton Abbott on the Saturday. Wow. So that, I mean, that's a, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm doing the, it was meant to be this week actually and got postponed, but I'm doing the coast to coast. And I looked at the mileage and I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be doing the coast to coast when I looked at how far you're going to have to, to cycle. Uh, absolutely incredible feat. So um, I hope, one time to, I hope your bottom isn't as sore as mine has been the last <laughs> few days while I've been doing some training. Because crikey, it's uh, it can be hard work, but that that's absolutely fantastic. So, uh, well, good luck with that, and um, I'm sure I'll, what I'll do actually is I'll send a link round to everyone in Foxtrot with the uh, with your yeah, details yeah, so that they can go on just giving and and support you because that's a tremendous cause. Um, now, our time is about up, but just before you go, let's uh, let's ask you for an insight into a horse that we should look out for for the coming season so everyone's going to get their notebooks out so have you have you got a horse obviously other than Kabinsky who I know you're particularly excited about but other than Kabinsky is, is there a horse in the yard that we should look out for yeah it's, it's always hard to pick one um but I obviously will um and he's called Jet of Magic um, I sort of we, we've got quite a lot of horses that we've bought from Ireland, either have won or been placed in a bumper or one or been placed a point to point. And it's pretty hard to split them all, you know, because you just until they start running, it's hard to know the form inside out. But I just like this horse. Um, I feel I, I feel all their legs before everybody arrives at work um, in the morning. And um, he's been in a couple of weeks now. And I just I've just really taken a shine to him. He's called Jetta Magic. He won his only bumper start at. It was like a point-to-point -point bumper that they put on um, sort of during COVID. And he won at Punchtown and the point-to-point -point bumper is on the inside track. And he's a massive, lovely horse. And I think he just found it quite difficult in the t on the tight track, but he did it anyway um, by Jetaway, which is this everybody's raving about. And he just he just seems a very kind horse. So he'll go novice hurdling late October. And I, I think he, he could be a little bit special. Brilliant. Well, very good luck with him. And... Uh... Oliver, thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted to say you've already got a donation. Pat has already been online and donated, so that's okay. that's that's one box ticked anyway. <laughs> uh, but we really appreciate you joining us this evening. It's great, I think, for, for everyone in Foxtrot. Obviously, we've just got 20 people involved in Kabinsky, or 18 at the moment, but hopefully 20 by the end of this evening. Um, 20 people involved in Kabinsky. But it's great, I think, for everyone in the Foxtrot family to, to get to meet you and get to know you. And I know you're coming to our party as well. Uh, in the autumn. So really looking forward to, to catching up with you there as well. Um, so Oliver, thank you again for joining us. Really delighted to have you on board with us and uh, good luck with all your horses for the coming season. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye everybody. Right, so that's Oliver Greenall and thanks again to him for, for joining us. Now our last guest this evening is actually the man that bought Kubinski, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, that Mark Jusgro is with us this evening. Mark, how are you? Good evening, thank you. Yeah, very good, thank you, Dan. And I must compliment you. I've had 48 years of people not being able to pronounce my surname, and we've known each other for 18 months, and I think you've nailed it. So <laughs> I, I must say thank you very much for that. I don't, don't know about that. But uh, anyway, we're, we're really pleased that you're, you're with us, and... Uh, I did try and do my my beach impression earlier, and then my it, it obviously affected my my computer so much it managed to crash. So I've got a very boring wall behind me rather than on the beach. But it looks like you're somewhere sunny anyway. Where where are you based? I, I wouldn't say sunny. We don't see too much Wales uh, sunshine in South Wales, but it's actually it's actually a very pleasant evening. Uh, I've got the, I'm um, staring out on the back garden at the moment, so yeah, it's a very pleasant evening. Well, look, you've had a huge amount of success. Uh, if you heard earlier, Richard Newland was singing your praises for the, the horses that you've purchased for him. And of course, purchased several horses for us, which are well known, like Mr Muldoon, but also Ultimate Getaway, who's been a tremendous success for us and uh, you know already two wins this summer. And this is another horse that you pointed out to us. But what one thing, Mark, that seems to stand out with the horses that you recommend is very much about value. And that obviously is a, a key element to what you're looking for. 
Very much so. I mean, Richard pointed out that this game is very, very easy if you've got unlimited funds and, and very, very deep pockets. It's, it's not rocket science to buy good horses when you've got huge budgets. But ultimately, the figures don't add up. It do, um, it, you know, I know prize money is an issue um, in the industry at the moment. But by the same token, I still believe that if you work hard and you have the right contacts and you have, you know, you can you're open to explore different angles. There are horses out there that can be sourced very sensibly, say, if you do your due diligence as well. And sometimes I think when we talk, what we're trying to find is good horses at sensible prices, but, but they've maybe not reached the heights yet that we, we hope they're capable of for the future. The horses that have already reached the heights or already got the very, very good form on paper, in, re in reality, are too expensive. So we're trying to find those horses that we generally believe at some point in the future are going to rate a lot higher than what they are at the present time. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the market at the moment. Obviously, we've had COVID. We seem to be sort of coming out of that now. What, what are prices like at, at the sales at the moment? Absolutely extraordinary, to be honest with you. Every single sale since... Um, what I would probably class, not, not we're, st we're obviously still in the pandemic as such, but since um, restrictions were relaxed a little bit, prices have absolutely been sensational. They broke every single record. Um, store sales in particular. Um, I, I can't admit these Irish point-to-point trainers, they must, you know, uh, well, it wouldn't be for me, shall we say, when they're spending upwards of 70, 80, 90,000 pounds on horses to go point to point in as three-year-olds to sell on. It just shows you the strength of the market. Um, I think people had, initially, they were happy to be able to go to the sales. They've not, they've been out of the game in many ways for sort of 12 months. They've missed that buzz. Owners, again, they've not had the buzz of being able to go to the races. And when, you know, things were relaxed a bit, they're thinking, gosh, we've missed it. Let's go and buy another horse. Um, but the sales have been extraordinarily popular. Uh, prices have been through the roof. Um, I think Doncaster, uh, which is Wednesday and Thursday this week, will be a similar issue. So um, it means that we have to work even harder to try and source them privately. I think the other thing as well is that sort of post-Brexit, um, it's very, it's a lot more difficult to, to get horses from Ireland, for example, certainly from France, Germany, places like that. So if they do go to the sales in the UK, buyers don't have to go through that. They, the paperwork's already done. So they are prepared to pay a little bit of a premium. So they can basically bid for the horse, have the hammer knocked down. The horse will be there. They can take it away in the horse box and know they're going to get it. Whereas at the moment, it is difficult to get them out of Ireland uh, with paperwork, ta taxes, veterinary checks. Um, it's certainly not a case of, ringing up the transporter, have you got a box going tomorrow? I've got a horse here, it's paid for, it's vetted. No chance. It takes, you know, it's going to take at least a week by the time I say you've done the paperwork, you've got the veterinary checks. Uh, and I say even down to sort of paying duty and taxes now, it's, it's not easy. So when people go to the sales in the UK, they know they can take the horse away and that sort of, you know, all that paperwork and all that um, has already been sorted out. You mentioned about the point to point sort of in in Ireland. Now, obviously, that the point to points were suspended or stopped, if you like, during mm. the pandemic. So, what's the situation then now, and and what impact has that had on the sales market or on on the sales? Um, well, going forward, uh, I think normality has been resumed. Um, I don't think we're going to see anything different. The four year, the four and five year old points, which are basically the bread and butter for the Irish point-to-point -point trainers. Again, 95% of them are doing it as a business as opposed to a hobby, which for most people, and in English point-to-point, it's, you know, it's a way of spending their spare cash. It's more of, and that's, that may be a little bit of a generalisation because there are some very, very good point-to-point -point trainers in the UK. Um, Richard mentioned one, Tom Weston. Um, he's a very, very good point-to-point -point trainer and he probably, he probably have a bit more of a business hat on. But in Ireland, 95% of people who train pointers are there to get a young course, train it, hopefully win a race and sell it on for a profit. Um, so going forward, I think 
it, things are back to normal. What I found is over the past 12 months that when point to pointing was stopped in Ireland, um, there was a lot of people very worried and they did sell off some of their stock because they needed to bring some money in. But for me personally, I didn't feel I could step in at that point because none of these horses had run. And you've got nothing to sell. You've got, you know, you, you, you can't say with conviction, oh, what a lovely horse this is because it's never run. It might show you very nice signs at home, but ultimately it's the race course where they prove themselves. So I had to take a little bit of a step back, but where I thought my niche was, um, when pointing did resume, it was only it was restricted to four and five year olds only because the point to point lobby was this is this is business for us. We need to run these horses. In many ways, it's a restraint of trade. We've got to get these horses on the race course because if we don't, you're going to find point to point uh, trainers who ultimately won't be able to pay the sales company or won't be able to reinvest. So when they when pointing came back, it was it was simply restricted to four and five year old horses. So that gave me an opportunity then to look at the maybe slightly older horse who'd already run or maybe only had one run. Um, I knew they had a level of ability, but because they couldn't run, um, they, they were a lot, lot cheaper. And what I was finding, I was able to buy six-year-olds at a fraction of the price that a five-year-old would be, but simply it was a year older through no fault of its own. And, and hopefully that's going to pay dividends in the next few years. Well, Mark, you, you've done an incredible job for us so far, buying several horses very, very cheaply, yeah. whose form have had to be uh, turned round. But you've bought a horse for us now that's only run once and won once. So this is most unusual. I think we and, retire uh, it then. And that's probably the best thing to do <laughs> with a 100% record. <laughs> Um, so tell us just a little bit about Kabinsky. Obviously, we've heard from Oliver Green, who's been delighted with him. Um, just tell us a little bit ab about him and, and, and the, the, the background to, to, to Kabinsky. It's, it was previously owned by a very, very good friend of mine. I've been open and honest about that, but he's he, I've known him for 25 years. I went to college with him, uh, Quine College. And I can honestly say he's one of the best judges I've come across in the game. I use him. Um, various opportunities whenever he offers me a horse or recommends a horse it's something I, I always look very very deeply into and quite simply with this horse is um, because of Covid um, what he felt was that um, he felt the horse would have a better opportunity in um, in England to win a bumper he felt he was more of a bumper type initially um, than a point to point horse. Plus, the fact is that the point to points in Ireland, four and five year olds are so strong. You know, you I say you've got horses that cost best part of a hundred thousand as stores running in point to points in Ireland. And he, he was very sensible about it. And he, he sort of, you know, in its homework, he realized because he'd worked in England before and he thought this is a perfect time for a uh, type for an English bumper. Um, he could have run it in Ireland. Um, but um, he doesn't hold a, a license at the moment. He's a pre-island and a point-to-point -point trainer. Uh, there's various reasons for that. Uh, financial, as much as anything, it costs an incredible amount of money with insurances to hold a license in Ireland. And he, he spotted an opportunity. Uh, and the horse came over approximately three or four weeks beforehand, uh, before its run. They certainly fancied the horse. He was very, very well backed. And I know he went off odds on. Um, and so you think, gosh, how much money did he have? Obviously, there was non-runners, but they confidently expected this horse to win, irrespective if, if there'd been a full field. Uh, so um, when I get a recommendation like that from somebody who I've you know, admired and trusted over a number of years, I know on the whole, it, they're not going to get it very, very far wrong. And if they do get it wrong, They've got it wrong for the right reasons. It's not a case that they want to sell me something. They take great pride in selling nice horses. And if they aren't going to be nice horses, they won't, you know, they won't go down that avenue. Or they or they'll be honest and say, look, I only think this horse can go so far. They won't give people false hope and expectation. And I'd say when you speak to people, 
and you know the language that they use. Some people are very, you know, abulient about horses and they'll tell you it's going to win this, it's going to win that, and they're very, very enthusiastic. Uh, this source, he's very straight to the point, he's very truthful, very honest, and he's most important, he's very accurate. So I was delighted when I got this opportunity to buy this horse. And I think if um, if the race had been a little stronger in terms of, you know, non, non-runners, I think he would have been a horse that we could have uh, maybe gone to the sales and made more money. I think that was actually our bit of luck that there was the non-runners and hopefully time will tell. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that uh, that you've even bought a share in this horse yourself. Yeah, well, I've actually done it for my father, yeah. Um, to be honest, it's something I've been thinking about with Box Trot for a, num- uh, a, a long time. Um, it's, diffi- it's difficult necessarily to pick the right one. It's not because I necessarily have favourites or um, obviously I've got loyalties to trainers as well. Um, and ultimately, I do this for a living. So I spent, if I spent it all on buying shares. Um, the mortgage company might not be very happy about it, but I just felt this was the right time. I genuinely believe in the horse and I genuinely believe in the package of the trainer and the horse and the horse going forward as well. I didn't say it was something I wanted to do. The opportunity arose and hopefully um, my father's going to have plenty of fun like everybody else in the syndicate. Well, let's hope let's hope so. But uh, no, that's been brilliant, Martin, and a real insight into into your work. And I know how much work goes into this, and how many horses you look at and reject, and uh, you know, long before you pick up the phone to me. But everything that you've recommended so far has done outstandingly well, and we're very grateful for that. So, thank you for all your hard work sourcing these horses, and uh, long may that continue. Thank you, Dan. But well, I said, to be fair, it, it is a team effort. You know, um, you know, I, I, I still think I've got the easy part of it in many ways. Um, yes, I can recommend horses, but somebody else has to pay for them and somebody else has to train them. So it, it is very much a team effort. But hopefully if we get if we get the right product, it gives everybody else the opportunity to get to do the right job as well. So fingers crossed. And I think, uh, well, we obviously we, we bought quite a few horses together now that haven't raced yet. And I, I genuinely feel that, um, the best days are ahead of us. We've got some lovely young horses for next year, you know, sort of those, especially those sort of points pointers we bought from Ireland. Um, I really do generally think they'll, they are, they are going to go to the next level. Well, lots to look forward to. And Mark, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us again. Really appreciate it. And enjoy the sunshine in Wales. I, I, I will, because we don't see it very often. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> So, Mark, thanks for joining us. That's brilliant. And that concludes our forum for this evening. I really appreciate everyone joining us. We've had lots of people involved, both on YouTube, but also here on Zoom. We've had an incredible year so far. 18 winners already this year. 15 second places knocking on the door. Our record in any calendar year is 20. So hopefully we can knock through that record in the coming months. We've got lots of other things coming up. We've got the Foxtrot Golf Day. We've got the Foxtrot Party, which has already uh, had over 100 people who purchase a ticket for the party. So that's going to be a fantastic night. Lots of our trainers are going to be in attendance there. So lots to look forward to, particularly with the race courses now fully open and hopefully all the restrictions of the pandemic behind us. So really looking forward to the autumn and the winter season. But before then, let's hope for plenty of winners in the rest of this summer. Thank you all so much for all your support, uh, which is, as always, very much appreciated. And I hope to see everyone on a race course very soon. Enjoy the rest of the sunshine. Enjoy the two-week break from National Hunt Racing. And we'll look forward to catching up with everyone very soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Dan.